We're going to examine a subject that is very near and dear to my heart. And I trust that this message will help develop a deeper appreciation for what we say at the conclusion of our services here at Crenshaw Christian Center, New York. The title of this message is The Power of our benediction. As members of this local congregation, we are blessed in so many different ways. We've been taught about the importance of our salvation and its manifold benefits, and that's something that to me is like one of Elder Nate's specialties. He really, really makes that very clear. We understand that we must grow as believers and become true disciples of Christ. I mean, do you know how many churches across America don't even have discipleship training classes? That's something that we have here. And we do all of these things and we are afforded this wonderful teaching because it enables us to be successful Christians. Because how many people know that there are Christians who truly love God, but they're really not having successful lives? And I don't believe it's because they don't want to or that their love for God is any less, but they're not always given the proper instruction. Because sometimes people go to church week after week after week, and all they're getting is a little inspiring tidbit. But I can tell you for a fact, I grew up in a Baptist church where it was filled with inspiration. And that's a wonderful, nice thing. But that didn't teach me what I needed to be as a better daughter to the, of the king, as a better wife, as a better mother, and most importantly, how to rear my children and pay my bills. That inspiration wasn't helping me. I needed to be taught the word. And that's something that we're afforded here. And I think we're just so blessed with that. I never, ever not, I, I don't, I appreciate it. I don't ever take it for granted. Now we've learned to walk in the love of God as well as be mindful of our confessions of faith and just so much more. Wouldn't you agree? I'm sure we all have our stories to tell about why we're here and why we love being a part of Crenshaw Christian Center New York. One of the things that we've been taught and I want to highlight that today is that we're definitely familiar with this verse of scripture that I'm going to have you turn to. Turn with me to Proverbs, the 18th chapter, and the 21st verse. Many of you probably already know it by heart. And let me know when you're there by saying I have it. Proverbs 18, verse 21. Now, we're going to go through a lot of scripture today. So if you, you know, everybody usually has tablets or smartphones or whatever. If you find that it's going a little fast, just jot it down so you can go back. Okay, fair enough, because I really got to cover a lot in a short period of time. But you should be at Proverbs 18 by now. Are you? Yes. Okay, great. So if we look at verse 21 out of the New King James Version, it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. The Amplified says death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it and indulge it will eat its fruit and bear the consequences of their words. And the message is short and sweet and says words kill, words give life. They're either poison or fruit you choose. Now this is super, super powerful. I mean we could do a whole message just on this particular verse of scripture, especially if you are in a relationship with uh, a spouse or if you have children or if you even come in contact with people in general. Your words, the things that you say can make all of the difference in every single one of those relationships I mentioned. And for parents it is so important that the words you speak speak to your children and over your children are going to give them life, going to give them health. Let them know that they are valued. Let them know that they are loved. It is so important that we do that and we do it with our words. As Christians, we've been taught the importance of our words, but 
still, we get caught up in not always paying attention. It's a discipline that we've really got to work at and develop. Now this is critical because our words can be just as powerful as a nuclear weapon. And I don't think we always realize that. When we speak as believers, we are giving birth to what comes out of our mouths. We really can't afford to speak without thinking. When we do, we may find ourselves in a negative situation created by our own words. In other words, sometimes going back to children, once they get into teenage years, well even before that, because I remember, have, has anyone ever heard the term terrible twos? Yes. Okay. And people say that, and you want to know something? Every person that says it, believe it or not, when their child is two, they are really a handful because that's what they've confessed. That's what they've said. They created that terrible two. It can be the same thing with teenage years. So I learned quick that my children, when they're two, oh, they're going to be wonderful. Oh, they're going to be such a blessing. And I avoided the terrible twos. Now, it took me mm, maybe a couple of children before I mastered it for the teenage years, because the teenage years can be challenging sometimes. But it's OK. You learn. You make mid-course corrections. It's so important that you speak what you want to see manifest over the children. Then you will have what it is that you say. So that's just another little sidebar. So <laughs> how many of you would agree that we, through our words and anything else, don't want to help the enemy out? Okay, because y'all are real. Okay, thank you. I definitely don't want to help him out. He, he, I mean, he makes life challenging enough as it is. Now, this is a little sidebar, which <laughs> I'm led to say it, so I'm going to say it. We are progressing here, even at Crenshaw. You heard um, Mr. Williams get up, and he told us last week how we're now going to be able to get our messages on our phones. I mean, we are really evolving here. And I think that's a wonderful thing. But here's the caveat. There is an anointing upon each of your lives as a believer. But when we come together as a congregation, there is a corporate anointing. And that is not something that you can get from your phone and a chocolate donut or looking up you know, at somebody on the TV screen. That's not going to work. We already know that one can put 1,000 in flight, two can put 10,000 in flight. But when we come together as a corporate body, we are doing something super powerful. So it is important that you make sure, even though you have the ability to listen to the messages on your phone, be here. Because you can't get that. That's not something that technology can do. It cannot create that corporate anointing. So make sure that you don't lull into that or get caught up into thinking, oh, I don't need to go to church. Uh -uh. Don't, that's, that's a trick of the enemy. And I don't want you to get caught up in that. So that's a little sidebar, but I was led to say it. So anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to examine each sentence. Our benediction is four sentences. It's not that long, but it is super, super powerful. But I don't want you not to understand where it came from. It's not cute little words we just say and they sound nice and that's why we do it. No, there is scripture. Just like we teach you that if you're believing God for anything, you go find the word that you can stand on, right? Well, I want you to have the word when it comes to our benediction so that when you say it, you understand the importance of it and the power that's released in every single word. So we're going to examine each sentence and it's going to reveal to you just how powerful what we what we are saying really really is now I know for a fact that many of you out of the goodness of your heart because you're just really sweet and you're choosing to be obedient you just repeat the benediction without really truly ever thinking about what you're giving birth to with your words you just say it for instance if you go and you meet a clerk in a store, or you might go to a concert or sight and sound and you're sitting next to a stranger you never even met, you may go ahead and say, hi, how are you? Being authentic, really authentic, 
You don't really give a care how they are. You're just saying it because we've been trained to be courteous. We've been trained to say that. And you can prove my point if after 10 minutes later, someone were to ask you, how is that person? You don't really know because you really didn't care. You just did it because that's what you were trained to do. And I want us, I think <laughs> that's my assignment lately, is to, uh, to push the envelope so we're not just mo moseying on through life, just doing things because it's nice and we're good little Christians and praise the Lord. Yeah, okay, no, well, this is serious. We are in a time when we've got to know that we know what we're saying. We've got to know when we open our mouth the power that's in it. We've got to know when we ask the Lord for something that he is going to answer it and we need to know. we got to be mindful of what we're doing, not just kind of skate by. That time... It's over. It really, if you want to be successful. Now, if you just want to stay status quo, praise the Lord. But that's not my assignment. So anyway, <laughs> um, turn with me because we're going to deal with the first sentence in the benediction, which does anybody know what that is? God still sits on the throne. So turn with me to Matthew's gospel, the 23rd chapter, and we're going to look at verse 22. Matthew 23, verse 22. And the New King James Version says, And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. The Amplified says, And whoever swears an oath by heaven swears both by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. And the Living Bible puts it this way, And when you swear by heavens, you are swearing by the throne of God and by God himself. Now we're going to spend a little time in the book of Revelation, and we're going to go through three scriptures there. Now the book of Revelation, what's very interesting about it, is it's actually written by the Apostle John, who is one of the 12 disciples. And all of everything that he speaks of in Revelation was given to him by divine inspiration through a series of visions. And the thing that's so special about this particular book is that John is affirming the fact that Jesus would fulfill his promises and accomplish his purpose in history. So that's what makes this book so extra, extra special. So turn with me to Revelation 3, and we're going to look at the 21st verse. Revelation 3, verse 21. In the New King James Version, it says, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now, obviously, he's speaking of Jesus sitting on the throne. And the Amplified, it says, He who overcomes the world through believing that Jesus is the Son of God, I will grant to him the privilege to sit beside me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down beside my Father on his throne. And the New International Version says, To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. So all of us want to and profess to be victorious, correct? Okay. So you're in Revelation. Now just turn over to the fifth chapter. And we're going to look at verse 13. Revelation 5, verse 13. And it says in the New King James, and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And the Amplified, and I heard every created thing that is in heaven or on earth or under the earth, in Hades, the realm of the dead, or on the sea, and everything that is in them saying together, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, Christ, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And we love that because that, I mean, they even have made beautiful songs based upon that verse of scripture. Now, if we look at, this is the last one we're going to look at in Revelation 22. Revelation 22, and we're going to read verses 1 through 5 out of the Amplified. And it says... 
Then the angel showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, Christ, in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer exist anything that is cursed because sin and illness and death are gone. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And his bondservants will serve and worship him with great awe and joy and loving devotion. They will be privileged to see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and there will no longer be night. They have no need for lamplight or sunlight because the Lord God will illumine them and they will reign as kings forever and ever. Now, if that does not say to you and show you that God still sits on the throne, I really don't know what does. So you can have confidence in saying that, knowing that it's just not a cute saying, but it is established in the word. Now, the other thing is, when we do say that God still sits on the throne, <laughs> it is written in the word and it reminds the enemy that's what's so important. It's reminding him of the very next sentence in our benediction, which is, the enemy has already been defeated. Let's look at 1 John. And we're going to look at 1 John, the third chapter, verses 7 and 8. 1 John, the third chapter, verse 7, in the New King James Version says, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. The Amplified it's, it has a little bit more qualifiers. It says, little children, believers, dear ones, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who practices righteousness, the one who strives to live in. Now see, this is the qualifier, I have to say that. Because again, we get desensitized to certain things even when we're reading scripture. Because we read, okay, the one who practices righteousness. So people just go, okay, well that's Christians, we're righteous. Let's qualify what righteousness means. The one who strives to live a consistently honorable life in private as well as in public and to conform to God's precepts is righteous. That's a big difference, okay? So that's why I really like the Amplified. Um, verse 8, the one who practices sin, separating himself from God and offending him by acts of disobedience, indifference, or rebellion is of the devil and takes his inner character and moral values from him, not God. For the devil has sinned and violated God's law from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. Now Jesus also, in addition to coming to destroy the works of the devil, he also rescued us from the enemy. Turn with me to Colossians, the first chapter, verse 13. Colossians 1, verse 13. Are you there? Okay, good. The New King James Version says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. The Amplified puts it this way, For he has rescued us and has drawn us to himself from the dominion of darkness and has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. And I love the easy to read because it simply says, God made us free from the power of darkness, and he brought us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now Jesus also conquered death for us because we are not like unbelievers with no hope because he took care of that for us too. Turn with me to Hebrews, the second chapter, and we're going to read verse 14. Hebrews 2, verse 14. And it says in the New King James, 
Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. If you look at it in the Amplified, it says, Therefore, since these his children share in flesh and blood the physical nature of mankind, he himself, and when we're saying he himself, I hope you know we're talking about Jesus, he himself in a similar manner also shared in the same physical nature but without sin, so that through experiencing death he might make powerless, ineffective, impotent him who had the power of death that is the devil. And the easy to read, these children are people with physical bodies. So Jesus himself became like them and had the same experiences they have. Jesus did this so that by dying he could destroy the one who has the power of death, the devil. Now he also did something else which is extra special. He gave us a powerful tool so that we could use this tool as we were in this earth realm because of course we know we have an adversary, the devil, so he gave us something to help us along in that area too. Turn with me to John's Gospel, the 16th chapter, and I'm going to read verses 5 through 11. John's Gospel, the 16th chapter, verses 5 through 11, and I'm going to share it out of the Amplified. And again, whenever you have the opportunity, because this happens to be one of my favorite <laughs> uh, chapters in the whole Bible, uh, John 16, for this reason, for me, it allows you to see the heart and the character of Jesus in one chapter. It, it's just amazing. So anyway, John 16, starting with verse 5, it says, but now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? Now this is Jesus talking to his disciples, okay? Verse six, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts and taken complete possession of them. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengther, standby will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him, the Holy Spirit, to you, to be in close fellowship with you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world about the guilt of sin and the need for a savior, and about righteousness and about judgment, about sin and the true nature of it, because they do not believe in me and my message, about righteousness, personal integrity, and godly character, because I am going to my Father and you will no longer see me, about judgment, the certainty of it, because the ruler of this world, Satan, has been judged and condemned. This is so important today especially because there are believers who have not been taught the word, who are still going to churches where they stand up and give them a nice little text which might be two or three little sentences and they go off on what I call their sermon of the week, show of the week, inspirational dance and singing of the week, whatever to make people feel a little bit good to go back and get their heads beat up again for the rest of the week because they're not being taught. This right here makes it very clear that the ruler of this world right now is who? It is Satan. However, there are Christians as well as non-believers who are blaming all of this foolishness that's going on right now on God. God, thinking that, well, God is down on his job. How can he be allowing all this stuff to go on? Because they're not being taught. It's our responsibility even for ourselves not to remain ignorant. We need to know what the world is, what the word is saying so that we don't get caught up in those traps where we can start agreeing with them. No, there's nothing to agree. It says right here, okay, that Satan is the God of this world right now. And he has been judged. And what else did it say? condemned which means what he's already been what defeated you need to know that you can take that and put that in the bank it's very important for you to understand and know so 
In addition, and this part I think is very interesting, because we could actually say Satan is really delusional in the sense that he really thinks he's all powerful and he's really got everything taken care of. He never was smart enough to read the back of the book. Turn with me to Revelation and we're going to look at the 20th chapter and we're going to start with verse 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 3 out of the Amplified. Revelation 20, starting with verse 1. Are you there? Okay, great. And it says, And then I saw an angel descending from heaven, holding the key of the abyss, the bottomless pit, and a great chain was in his hand. And he overpowered and laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, <laughs> the primeval times, who is the devil and Satan. So again, we don't have to guess. He's telling us right here, okay? And bound him securely for a thousand years, a millennium. And the angel hurled him into the abyss and closed it and sealed it above him, preventing his escape or rescue, so that he would no longer deceive and seduce the nation until the thousand years were at an end. After these things, he must be liberated for a short time. So we could stop right there, but we're not. We're going to go down to verse 7 because we want to find out what happens when he has that little bit of time. And verse 7 says, and when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison, the abyss, and will come out to deceive and mislead the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, including Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. Their numbers is like the sand of a seashore. And they swarmed up over the broad plain of the earth and surround, surrounded the camp of the saints, God's people, and the beloved city Jerusalem. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was hurled into the lake of fire and burning brimstone, sulfur, where the beast, antichrist, and false prophet, and false prophet are also, and they were tormented day and night for how long? Forever and ever. Does that sound to you like you can say that the devil has already been defeated? The key is that as Christians, we need to know that we know that we know that he has already been defeated. So come what may, you know your adversary's already been defeated. You are on top, but you've got to know that. You have to understand that. And most importantly, you've got to also understand the third sentence that Jesus is Lord. Turn with me to Luke's Gospel, the second chapter. And this is a quick little verse, but we all know it. It's on all the wonderful little Christmas cards we try to send out. Luke 2, verse 11. The New King James Version says, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The Amplified says pretty much the same thing, but I, I like what they end with. Because it says, For this day in the city of David there was, has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord, the Messiah. Now turn to John's Gospel, the 13th chapter and the 13th verse. And this is Jesus speaking in this verse, John 13, 13. And the New King James Version says, and this is Jesus saying, You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. And then in the Amplified it says, You call me teacher and Lord, and you were right in doing so, for that is who I am. Now turn with me to 1 Corinthians, the 8th chapter. 1 Corinthians, the 8th chapter. And we're going to look at verse number 6. And the New King James says, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, who, from, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. If you look at it in the Amplified, it says, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, who is the source of all things, and we exist for him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all 
things that have been created and we believers exist and have life and have been redeemed through him. So is this not telling us that he's Lord? Look at Acts. Acts the second chapter and the 36th verse. Acts 2 verse 36. Now am I going too fast? You're following along? Because you guys are good. Okay. New King James Version, it says, Therefore, let all of the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And the Amplified, Therefore, let all of the house of Israel recognize beyond all doubt that God has made him both Lord and Christ, Messiah, anointed this Jesus, whom you crucified. Now you're in Acts, just turn forward to the 10th chapter. Acts 10 verse 36 again and it says the word which God sent to the children of Israel preaching peace through Jesus Christ he is Lord of all and the Amplified you know the message which he sent to the sons of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ who is Lord of all. Now, if that's not clear enough, God clears it up and makes his position very clear. Turn with me to Philippians, the second chapter, verses 9 through 11. Philippians, the second chapter, verses 9 through 11. The New King James Version. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him, meaning Jesus, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then the Amplified says, for this reason also, because he obeyed and so completely humbled himself, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in submission of those who are in the earth and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess and openly acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, sovereign God, to the glory of God the Father. And this is the piece de la resistance. Turn with me to Revelation, the 19th chapter and the 16th verse. Revelation 19, 16. And it says, and he, meaning Jesus, has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And the Amplified says the same. It just says that he has his name inscribed as King of kings, Lord of lords. <laughs> so to me, I mean, come on, Jesus is clearly Lord. An important aspect that we must remember and stand firmly on is the fourth line of our benediction that says, wherever you are, God is. Okay? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, and verse 16. This was even something that Minister Scott talked about a little bit the last time he spoke last week. 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, and the 16th verse. In the New King James Version says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? And the Amplified says, do you not know and understand? See, that's important, that you gotta understand it, okay? That you, the church, are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells permanently in you collectively and individually. Now, you're in 1 Corinthians, just flip over to the sixth chapter. 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, and we're going to read verses 19 and 20. Are you there? Okay. The New King James Version says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit 
who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The Amplified says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you, whom you have received as a gift? from God and that you are not your own property. You were bought with a price. You were actually purchased with the precious blood of Jesus and made his own. So then honor and glorify God with your body. This is powerful stuff. Turn with me to Colossians, the first chapter. And we're going to look at verses 26 and 27. Colossians 1, verses 26 and 27. The New King James Version says, The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them, God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now that is good, and that's exciting, but I got to be frank. You can read this and it still sounds a little bit like a mystery. It's not 100% clear. So that's why we're going to read it out of the easy to read who really breaks it down. This translation really breaks it down. It says it this way. This message is the secret truth that was hidden since the beginning of time. It was hidden from everyone for ages, but now it has been made known to God's holy people. God decided to let his people know just how rich and glorious that truth is. That secret truth, which is for all people is that Christ lives in you, his people. He is our hope for glory. Oh, goodness. So, I mean, come on. That, I, to me, I thought that was great. Turn with me to Colossians. You're still in Colossians. Go to the second chapter. And we're going to look at verses 8 through 10. Colossians 2, verses 8 through 10. And I want you to see this. So are you there? Okay. This time I'm going to start with the Living Bible translation. And as you know, and I, and I say this because for those of you who may not know me, I do the different translations for a reason. Um, just like I really happen to like chocolate ice cream, my husband likes pistachio ice cream. I don't know why. He probably doesn't know why I like chocolate. However, I can get excited over chocolate ice cream. You give me pistachio, I'm probably going to pass. I'm not interested. So when it comes to reading the scripture, we can all agree, but sometimes it's a little vague, and sometimes we really don't care for it that much. So I give you different translations, and I comb through them all before I come up here to stand before you, because I'm trying to give you a different way of thinking about it in each translation, so that hopefully I'm serving you something that you can grab hold to and really appreciate. Okay? Amen. So Colossians 2 verse starting with verse 8 out of the Living Bible says this. Don't let others spoil your faith and joy with their philosophies. That's extremely important right now in the time in which we're living. Okay? They're wrong and shallow answers built on men's thoughts and ideas instead of what Christ has said. For in Christ there is all of God in a human body. So you have everything when you have Christ. And you are filled with God through your union with Christ. He is the highest ruler with authority over every other power. That is so important. Now, if we look at it in the Amplified, it says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, pseudo-intellectual babble, okay, according to the tradition and musings of mere men, following the elementary principles of this world rather than following the truth, the teachings of Christ. For in him... 
all the fullness of deity that Godhead dwells in bodily form, completely expressing the divine essence of God. And in him, you have been made complete, achieving spiritual stature through Christ. And he is the head over all rule and authority of every angelic and earthly power. There is no way. If you're not getting somewhat moved by this, I will just continue to pray for you. <laughs> Now the message. The message breaks it down so you really can get it. And it says, watch out for people who try to dazzle you with big words and intellectual double talk, okay? They want to drag you off into endless arguments that never amount to anything. They spread their ideas through the empty traditions of human beings and the empty superstitions of spirit beings. But that's not the way of Christ. Everything of God gets expressed in him so you can see and hear him clearly. You don't need a telescope, a microscope, or a horoscope to realize the fullness of Christ and the emptiness of the universe without him. When you come to him, that fullness comes together for you too. His power extends over everything. Oh my goodness. Last but not least, turn to 1 John, the fourth chapter. And many of you should know this one by heart too. 1 John, the fourth chapter and the fourth verse. The New King James Version says it this way. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. The Amplified says, little children, believers, dear ones, you are of God and you belong to him and have already overcome them, the agents of the Antichrist, because he who is in you is greater than he, Satan, who is in the world of sinful mankind. And the Amplified Classic says it this way, little children, you are of God, you belong to him, and you have already defeated and overcome them, the agents of the Antichrist, because he who lives in you is greater, mightier, than he who was in the world. The scriptures prove that it is written and forever remains written that the entire Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit dwell within us. So what does all of this mean? Okay, why did I take your time and take your life? to explain all of this to you. What was the point? Why did I go there with it? <laughs> it means, and I can tell you from personal experience, that I don't care what you may be growing through. I don't give a care what challenge you may be up against. <laughs> the words, the power of the words released in our benediction give birth to peace, and they center your focus on the living word of the Most High God. If you allow it, the words of our benediction can be your compass. You see, I have sat across the desk from someone who was giving me news I did not want to receive. I know the word. I stand on the word. The word is my final authority. But I could sit across from that person and they couldn't figure out why I wasn't getting rattled because I remembered our benediction. I remembered that I don't give a care what you're telling me. My God still sits on the throne. It doesn't really matter all that you're saying because the enemy has already been defeated. And regardless of what you're saying to me, Jesus is Lord. And wherever I am, 
God is. And I submit to you, if you learn the power of this benediction, understand it. I just gave you the scripture that you can stand on. I don't care if you have to open up your checkbook and it, you are supposed to have X amount of money and you don't have anywhere near that, don't fret. Don't let it concern you. Why? Because God still sits on the throne. Meaning you have to take this and know and understand just how important it is. And use it. Don't just come in here. We have these wonderful Bible studies, these wonderful worship services. We get up and we just say, you know, yes, God still sits on the throne. Uh-uh. You need to understand. You're giving birth to this. You are putting the enemy on tranquilizer every single time you say it. We say it as a been addiction because we want you to leave this place knowing who you are and walking in the authority that's been given to you. But if you really don't understand it, I can understand where you really don't, it doesn't mean that much to you. That's the reason I wanted to share this with you. Because we are all going to walk through some kind of challenge and battle. That I can guarantee you. Now the good news is Jesus, if you look at John 16, 33, he will let you know that you don't have to be concerned because he has deprived the world of its power to harm you. So that's great. This takes a lot of scripture that you know and it is your compass. You know, on a compass it puts you right back in the right direction. It centers you and when you speak these words there is power that is released in the earth realm. You need to know that. So from this moment on, Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, may you remember and always remember and understand what you are actually saying when you speak the benediction. There is power in the words that are being spoken. For we are the redeemed of the Lord. And whatever we say is so. Thanks for joining us. Our hope is that you received something that you can apply to your life and strengthen your faith. At Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, we believe that the Word of God is practical for everyday application. If you'd like to support the ministry with your tithe and offering, you can mail them to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. We now offer the convenience of text and online giving, one of the most secure ways to give. Try it now. Simply text East G from your smartphone to 28950 and follow the prompts. You can even specify a designation for your gift. Text East G for general donation, East T for type, or East O for offering. Each transaction needs to be its own individual text message. You can also visit our website, BrentrawChristianCenterEast.org, and click the Give tab to begin your experience. Set up recurring donations or give one-time gifts. This experience is easy to use, secure, and requires a one-time registration only. Giving the second time is even easier. Simply text EASTG to 28950 with all your information securely stored. We appreciate your continued support and stand in agreement with you for the manifold return in your life. Thanks again for watching. And remember, we walk by faith, not by sight. We would like you, our viewers and partners, to join us in honoring the legacy of the Apostle by making a donation to the Apostle Frederick K.C. Price Library. The library will be on the grounds of the Faith Dome in Los Angeles, California, and it will be open to the public. It will be a place of study, learning, and research, available for anyone desiring to further their knowledge and understanding of the Christian faith. Visitors will also have a chance to learn more about our founder and his impact on the body of Christ and the world at large. You can mail your donations to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. If you are giving by check, be sure to designate in the memo area, Apostles Library. If you have Crenshaw Christian Center envelopes, you can mark AL on the envelope. You can also donate via your smartphone by texting EAST AL to 28950 and follow the prompts. We thank you in advance for your support. And as always, we stand in agreement for the manifold return in your life.